I don't know about you, but I always get uh, I always get challenged by Pastor Rick, and we should get challenged, shouldn't we? Unless your life's perfect and everything's where you want it to be, <laughs> then you don't need to be here. Amen. But no, I mean, like I love, I just, I just love the way Rick just not forces you, but in, by the Word of God shows us that there's a higher way of living, if we could just sum it up in a couple of words, a higher way of living, amen? Who wants to live higher? I think there's a scripture that says you'll be the head and not the tail. Is that true? Above and not beneath, amen? Come on. So, amen. So are we recording, guys? Do I need to welcome anybody? recording now so we welcome um, our family online and whoever's listening pray be blessed this morning let's pray guys father we just thank you for today Lord I thank you for what you've placed upon my heart and uh, as always Lord we just pray you'd open our heart and our mind and our spirit to hear what you've got to say to us individually and corporately we thank you that you love us Lord and um Everything that you do for us is in love, and uh, and this subject today is 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 your heart for your children. So we thank you for it, Lord. Help us to receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So no one knows what I'm going to talk about today because the title doesn't really explain what it is. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Uh, Maybe 10 years ago, maybe a bit longer, maybe 15 years ago, God uh, quickened that scripture to my spirit. And I'm not saying it's not this, but I'm not saying it is this either. So that scripture doesn't mean that if you read your Bible every day for the rest of your life, that you'll actually, your faith will increase. There's a chance it will increase. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But God took it a little bit deeper for me at that time. And he said, because you know how we've all heard, you know, we all, we've heard John 3.16 a million times, haven't we? If you've been in church, you know, but actually who really actually knows and experiences what that's like to know that if oh, I have, and I know other people have in the body that, you know, God said to you, if you were the only person on the face of the earth, that I would still have sent my son for you. Who's ever experienced that? Until you've actually experienced that, you actually really don't know what John 3.16 means. That's called the word. You've actually heard the word. So faith now rises up in you as a son. Value actually rises up in you as a human being. You become like what Rick talks about. You feel invincible because the because the creator of the planet has just made you the focal point of his life and said that if you're the only person living on the face of the earth, I still would have given up my son for you. And that's what he says to all of us. That is the reality for every person who's made Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. But do you know it? See, have you heard it? See, faith comes by more than just reading the scriptures. Faith comes by it actually being downloaded from this thing here to this thing here. This is the difference in the walk between a carnal Christian and one without power, right, which is me just as much as it is you for most of the time to then to the one who lives from it from inside here continually. Amen? And, and, and so all our messages from the pulpit are, are all to, to, to try and take us from this place of a, a mental knowledge of God to a inner knowing. It's, it's like light and day. It's like two completely different lives. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And what I want to focus on today is just one area of the gospel, which is physical healing. I feel like God wants to heal some people. <laughs> Amen. Come on. You know, like, I don't know about you, but I don't want to drag around my ailments for the rest of my life. Like, and, and um, 
you know, when I was 30, right, I used to sit in church, sit in a dark. I was here when I was 30. It was a few years ago now. And I was healthy and strong and fit. Had a lot of other problems, but my body was fine. <laughs> a lot of other problems that I needed healing in, but my body was fine. And I didn't really care about healing messages. That, there was no, I actually understood it. I got it. I was actually quite strong in it. I actually had, you know, walked in a bit of faith in that area. But I didn't really care. I didn't want to hear a healing message. But oh, when you start to get a few ailments. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, when you start praying for people and you actually don't see anything change, right? Who's ever gone out and cursed a bush to see if it would die? <laughs> Who's done that before? Come on. You should try it. Yeah, come on. Come on. Because Jesus said, whatever you say and believe, it'll come to pass. Well, I did that to a few gardens, tried to save myself a bit of pruning, but <laughs> a few customers' gardens, actually. So I don't want to be there anymore. <laughs> right? So we've, we've all done it, haven't we? But so, you know, like, I've actually had the privilege of, I've actually seen a lot of, I've actually seen like a lot of healings in my life, like not major healings, but certainly on myself. I've certainly, I've certainly seen a lot of healings for myself. Um, but I've seen a lot of not as well. You know, I've prayed for people who've died. <laughs> Sorry, it's just true, you know. And I think that if you, if you do any deep work on, Anyone who's been used by God in any area of healing, they'll say the same thing. They'll probably say hundreds of people didn't receive their healing. Yeah, I want to keep that up. And so the problem is, is that like scripture is our plumb line, isn't it? I'm building something out the back. Put a Plumb line on it yesterday, it didn't look too good. <laughs> a little bit out of square, right? So, so we shouldn't accept anything less than the plumb line of the Word of God. And I don't know about you guys, but if you ever do a deep dive into healing and, and the Scriptures and what the Scriptures demonstrate of Jesus' life, it is profound. And I've been doing this for 30 years. Like it's, I don't know, you know, sometimes you read the Bible and you go, how come I've never noticed this before? But I've read this a thousand times. So we're going to go into this today. Like I want to demonstrate to you not only what the Bible said about Jesus, but what his heart says about healing and how he feels about it and how, how Jesus is moved by compassion. That it's not just this little thing that you carry around a sore toe for the rest of your life. It's not just a little thing to him. It actually means a lot to him. Amen? <clears throat> so the word is our plumb line. I always say these four things. You know, the word is our plumb line. It's our compass in life, Right? It's our anchor, and it's our foundation. And if you can keep the Word of God, those four things in your life, I guarantee you, you will stay on the narrow path of life that Jesus is talking about. But any time you, you let one of those four things go, you will start to find yourself in some funny areas because that's what the Word of God is. And we always have to come back to the Word. And even when you come back to the Word, you'll miss it because you'll misinterpret the Word. But that's part of life. That's why we have a shepherd. Because when you're wandering off over here, he goes, nick, 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 nick. You know? But, what, but, but the anchors of those things are to say, one of those anchors, right, of the Word of God is to don't forsake the gathering of the brethren. Because there's wisdom found in the counsel of many. And so people want to run off and do all these little Christian things but never have anyone speak into their life. 
I'll never have anyone guide them. Never settle in a church. Never commit. Never put your roots down anywhere. And they wonder why they're off here with the fairies. And where's Jesus? Because you let an anchor go of the Word of God or a compass or a plumb line. These are just things that God says. This is not Pastor Tony's message. This is what God says. So if you keep the Word of God as a compass and an anchor and a plumb line, a foundation for your life, you'll always stay safe. Come on. Am I talking about healing yet? <clears throat> so I've shared, that, I've shared that story once when I was sitting in a doctor's surgery, and it's never happened since, but I was sitting in a doctor's surgery. I was there. I was actually at a 24-hour medical center here in Cairns. I walked in. I sat down, and, you know, you're surrounded by everyone else who's sick. <laughs> what a joyful place it is, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> no. Coughing, sneezing, kids crying, nurses are stressed out, air conditioning not working. It's like heaven, isn't it? And I didn't hear the Lord say this, but my spirit just witnessed to me and said, this is not, this is so foreign to me. It's like the Holy Spirit. This, this place. Is, is not, I don't know this place. Because we say on earth as it is in heaven, right? Like Jesus has taught the disciples to pray that you bring heaven to earth. There's no sickness in heaven. So the Holy Spirit can't relate to it. But yet we, we sit in these doctor surgeries and it's just normal because this is what you do when you're sick. You go to the doctor surgery. But the Holy Spirit's saying, this is not normal to me. This is foreign. This is like another world, isn't it? Are we aliens and strangers in this world? We are. That's what the Bible says about you. So we have to get this mindset that we, like we shouldn't just accept sickness like we accept, I don't know, your water bill coming in. Because right? that's what we do. But the Holy Spirit is so opposed to it. And, and, and last week in, um, it, when we were here and we were praying, I felt, I felt that the... the the strength of the Lord like a, like a lion opposed to sickness, like it was an enemy. Not like it was just something to brush away, but like it was actually something that was coming against him personally. Like he had a personal issue with it. Oh, I had not felt the Lord like that before. Yeah? So why do we accept it? See, here's another thing. Like, and, and I, you know, I love that scripture that Rick quoted this morning about the kingdom of God. Look, we need teachers. I love great messages, and we all need to learn. And this is how you build your faith, by hearing, right? But if somewhere down the line, power doesn't come out of that, this is what the scripture is saying. The kingdom of God is not just about talk. And so here's the deal with churches all over the world. We focus on programs to save the lost. Right, which is right. We set up structures in church to bring people in and make them feel comfortable. How do we win the lost? How do we win the lost? Yet Jesus just went around healing everyone and turned the place into a frenzy. There's your structure right there. Why don't you learn how to be healed and be a conduit to heal others and you'll grow the church? This is the same with everything. You know, we, so this is the same with everything in the gospel. You know, healing people is the greatest evangelistic tool that you can ever walk in. You don't need to tell them about Jesus. You don't need to say that new age is not God and you shouldn't have sex before marriage. And, you know, that's a sin and this is that and that's that. Just if they're walking around in torment for a while with a demon or with a sickness and you lay hands on them and it goes... All the talk's over, mate. Because, you know, like Chris Valadin says, a man with an experience or a man with a, an argument has no power over a man with an experience. See, the, the man who, got, who couldn't see and now can see, he doesn't really care what the Pharisees are saying. They can hit him with 15 million questions and he comes back and says, I don't know what you're talking about. But one thing I do know is I couldn't see that man laid his hand on me and now I can see. 
I don't really care about your gospel or your words. Because I live my whole life not seeing. Now I can see. (laughs) Wouldn't that be exciting? See, I always say about Vaughan, like if, if, or Vaughan or Fred or whoever it is, right, who's not able to walk, that if next week he's walking in here, what do you think that's going to do for your faith? I tell you, everyone in Regis will be here next week. Every nurse will be here next week. You won't have to preach the gospel. You'll just say, oh, this is where he got healed. Oh, how did that happen? Oh, we just, you know, Jesus just showed up. Sorry. Maybe too many coffees this morning. Come on, this is good news. So two things that, that we struggle with, with our own healing and with, you know, seeing other people heal. And, and the two things that I see predominantly with myself and, and with the body over the years has, has been, is, is, is God willing, right? Right? So here's the thing. See, every time we see a Christian, right, who dies, maybe prematurely, or dies from an, a, a, like something that we would not think is a nice death, it chips away at our faith, right? It, it, it makes us second doubt the anchors of the Word of God. It makes us start, and it's not wrong to think about things, not wrong to, you know, go down a few rabbit holes because that's good. That's what we want to do. We want to, we want to work out, you know, we want to ask God, what's going on? Why, how did that person die? So it doesn't happen again. Or how do we get, make it line up with the Word of God? This is called having a relationship with God. You talk to Him. Why did this happen, Lord? Right? But I'm telling you right now. See, I thought this when I was doing this message, because this is usually what happens when you do a message. The next day, the very thing that you've preached about comes against you somehow. <laughs> right? I don't know what it is. Right? So if I'm to drop dead tomorrow, right? Let's just say that. I'm just giving you, like, a few people are clapping, some are not. <laughs> right? This message doesn't change. The last thing I would want you to do with me standing in heaven is to doubt God as a healer. And he's the healer. He's not about me. It's not about them. It's about God and what he's like and what his nature is like and what his character is. And see, faith is found in the will of God. See, once you know the will of God, then your faith will rise. So anything that chips away at your faith in the will of God will chip away at your faith. So you actually won't believe you can be healed and you won't believe the person next to you can be healed. This is why it's so important to know what the will of God is. And you won't know what the will of God is unless you know what the Word of God says. And you won't know what the Word of God says unless you read it and unless you hear it. That's why the title's called Faith by Hearing. Faith by Hearing. Faith by Hearing. Someone died. Faith by Hearing. Someone else 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 died. Faith by Hearing. Faith by Hearing. Faith by Hearing. Bang. One day, you get it. No one else dies. No one else is dying on your watch. And if they do, it still doesn't change. So one of the things that, that we struggle with to know the will of God. See, you can, you can say, oh, I know the will of God is to heal in my head. But like I gave you that example of John 3, 16 at the start of the message, you can say it to your, the cows come home, but you're still going to be sick. And the person you pray for is going to be sick because you actually don't believe it. Let's just get real, church. Come on, this is the whole idea. Don't beat yourself up. There's no condemnation in Christ. It's just, it's like Bill Johnson said, it's an invitation to either go into depression and woe is me, or it's an invitation to press in for more. It's one or the other. You choose which one you want to do. A hundred people have died. Oh, I'm a loser. I can't heal anyone. God doesn't, God's word doesn't work. I think I'll give this a flick. Okay, that's your choice. Oh, you know, but God's word says this. So I'm just going to keep pressing in. I'm just going to keep pressing in. And if, if I have to die, like Hebrews 11 says, people died without seeing the promise. I'm still just going to die, believing in healing. See, come on. So, so a lot of it is we just have this 
unworthiness. As Christians, we just, we, we haven't walked into our sonship or daughtership. We, un, we don't understand how God feels about us. We don't, we don't see how he sees us as sinless and blameless because it's finished, a once and for all sacrifice. <laughs> You're the righteousness of God in Christ. See, we don't walk around like that. We don't walk around feeling like that. Right? So how can we give that to anyone else? How can you give it to a sinner? <laughs> someone who's swearing in front of you. Or someone who's living outside of a marriage situation. Someone who's doing something really wicked and evil. How can you pray for them and believe they'll get healed? We're going to see in Scripture a lot of people whose lives weren't together got healed. And I didn't see him go to a sozo. I didn't see him confess a hundred sins. I didn't see him repent before Jesus touched them or they touched Jesus. But I did see someone get healed. See, we've got to get all the clutter out of our head that God loves the world and he wants to show himself to them regardless of what they're doing. Because while you were a sinner, while you were a sinner, he died for you. He didn't wait for you to get it all together. He did it before you were born. <laughs> and now he's made you the righteousness of God in Christ. So are you going to reject the grace of God or are you going to walk in it? So when you fail, are you going to receive the grace of God that's already yours or are you going to wallow in it? I know which one empowers you. The grace of God empowers you. It's the grace of God that allows you to be a conduit to heal someone because you know that you're a sinner and you're forgiven and someone else who you're praying for is a sinner and they can be forgiven too. So you can't give out something you don't have. Another thing where you don't know if God's willing. These are just things that go through your mind. Oh, you know, I haven't. See, today, doing this message, oh, I don't think I should have an altar call. I haven't fasted enough. I haven't prayed enough, you know. And, and you know what, right? There's a time and a place for all this. And I, I don't disagree with this. But what am I already doing? I'm already putting the emphasis on me, right? I'm disqualifying myself to be used by what? It's God who does it anyway. It's not even about me. It's just about me being faithful. I don't know anyone in the Bible who healed anyone other than Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit. Do you know anyone in the Bible who did that? So it's not about us anyway, is it? Just that underlying subconscious that says I'm not enough. Okay, so that's the willing side. The other side is sometimes we just struggle with the power. Let's get real. I'll, talk, I'll use me as an example. I've never seen anyone who was blind and can now see from prayer. I've never seen it, Right? I've never seen anyone who was dead and now is alive. Have you? Julie has. That's great. I've never seen anyone get up out of a wheelchair and actually stay out of the wheelchair for the rest of their life. I've never seen it. I've heard about it. I've never seen it. Never been part of it. I've never seen anyone with stage four cancer where one day they're in the doctor's surgery, about to die, and then six months later they're walking around with nothing in their body and live for another 10 years. I've never seen it. So therefore, because I've never seen it and never experienced it, it chips away at my faith to believe for that when it happens. Doesn't it? So we have these two things going on. So I was recently reading... See, but faith not starts, faith, faith starts when the will of God is known. Just because you've never seen it doesn't mean you shouldn't try it. 
Doesn't mean you shouldn't step out on the water. I'd rather step out on the water and sink than stay in the boat. Wouldn't you? One of the worst things I ever did was not run a race that I was in to run because I was afraid. That doesn't happen anymore. Now I step out. <laughs> Might not like it, but I step out. So I was reading a recent book. I am reading a book recent, uh, recently. Well-known author, won't say who it is. But the title is, Healing is Always God's Will. It's always God's will, right? And because I'm believing God for a few things, and I shared my knee testimony last year, which was really great, which that was a definite healing. Um, one of the opening paragraphs in this book was, a believer must make a quality decision that is based on faith in the Word of God to receive healing. A believer must make a quality decision that is based on faith in the Word of God to receive healing. And the thing that stands out for me there is quality. And so I started meditating on that. What is that? What is a quality decision, Lord? Like, what, what, what do you mean? And, and, and the way I, I perceived it is that it's a, you need to make an unshakable decision on it. Like, I, I, so, so I'm believing God for different things in my body, right? And when the pain in my knee came back four months after I had no pain, when I was scheduled to have a meniscus operation, and I've been running hills again. I've run some. Of, I've run the highest hill in Queensland since that knee diagnosis. Right? No pain. No pain. No pain. Right? And then you know, a couple of months ago, the pain come back. Right? Now I spent about two hours in a bit of a wallow and woe is me, pity. I've told the whole church I'm healed. Now I'm going to look like an idiot, and you know, God's going to look like an idiot, and whoa. Da. And then I just, you know, I just righted myself. I went, no. I've been running for four months. I've just run the Queensland's highest hill. I've done the pyramid three times with no pain. I got healed. I don't know why it's back. But what I had to do was make a quality decision and stay in the place I'm healed. No one's taking this away from me because God said I'm healed. I had to make a quality decision right there and then. I had to come against whether it was the enemy whether it was my own mind, what it was, I don't know, but I definitely couldn't put weight on this leg, which is exactly what happened before I got diagnosed. I spent a day limping, but I had to do exactly the same thing that I chose to do when I got the initial healing. And I thought, what is a quality decision? And so here's a quality decision. If you really make a quality decision, when you say you're going to get married, you say, <laughs> oh my God, what am I doing? You say, I'm staying with this person or I'm choosing this person come hell or high water for the rest of my life, no matter what happens. And you know what else you're saying when you say you're saying I'm marrying this person? You're saying no to everyone else. It's a quality decision of very high standard. And, you know, it gets rocky, doesn't it? Right? <laughs> no. <Nah. laughs> My wife's here, so she'd like to have a chat with you, Peter, Pastor Peter. <laughs> right? But, but, but in the same way, see, you have to be like that with your faith about healing. And it's about like anything with the Word of God, because what, a double-minded man, what? And receives what? A double mind man receives nothing. It's not to condemn us. It's because everything that God does, right, he backs a quality decision. See, he backed Peter when he stepped out of the boat. There's only one person I know I've walked on water other than Jesus. <laughs> right? But what happened? Halfway through that quality decision, he started to doubt. See, that's what happened with my knee, right? You've got to be rock solid. See, this is why you need the Word of God in your life. See, because I, I, I know the Word of God, and it, and it rocked me. 
but I have to make a choice. So I go, I'm going to get up early the next morning. I'm going to read the Word of God. I'm going to get it into my spirit. I'm going to start strengthening myself, building myself up. I'm going to start praying in tongues because what does tongues do? Edifies yourself, builds you up. You speak to God, no one else. You speak out mysteries that no one else knows about. Building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Do what God tells you to do. Use the tools he's given you. See, so many Christians don't do what the word. They don't do the word. (laughs) It's a doer who is blessed, not a... Yes. (laughs) I'm going to speed this up because I want to give you some more of the word. (laughs) Amen. Come on. Who's, uh, Who's enjoying this? I will say this, if you're doing this and you're not seeing results, it goes back to a little bit what I shared about, what are you prepared to do? See, because the disciples did come to Jesus in the Bible after they'd healed lots of people. Because remember, he sent them out two by two and they came back and they were so excited, Lord, right? But then there's one instance where they come down from the hill and they can't heal this, get this guy healed. Right? And they're dumbfounded. It's not like they're going, oh, we knew it wouldn't happen, Lord. Like, you know, we knew only you could do it, Lord. No, they, they would genuinely couldn't work it out. And Jesus did say, right, this kind comes out only by something, by you actually doing more than what you've been doing. Right? You might actually need to press in with God. <laughs> you might actually need to cut your days of your lives time out and actually... Give it to God. Like, this is the reality of the gospel. You might actually have to sacrifice something. (laughs) Come on. See, this is what I stood on. So when I made that quality decision, I had to say this, and might still have to say this for the rest of my life with my knee, right? But he was wounded for my transgressions and he was bruised for my iniquities. He was wounded for my transgressions and he was bruised for my iniquities. Either he was or he wasn't. Either he is or he isn't. Either he has or he hasn't. See, either he has taken that on the cross, either he did have a meniscus tear on the cross for me, or he didn't. Either he did or didn't. It's a quality decision. There's no condemnation if you do this and it doesn't work. or Because this is what I'm saying. I've seen lots and I've seen not lots. But it still doesn't change this. So we build ourselves up in the Word of God. Let's just do a little run through the Old Covenant. See... You can just go, well, the old covenant just messes me up. But, you know, Jesus is easy to understand. But God, through the old covenant, is still the healer. Let's have a look at a couple of examples. Marie talked about it this morning. Well, let's look at the first one. The picture of of Israel being delivered out of slavery and bondage and under the oppression of Egypt tells us and shows us when he brought them out, The Bible says that there was none feeble among them, right? And they got the wealth of Egypt. And it's such a pertinent example of when you cross from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, when you have your Egypt experience, when you get saved, whether you see the physical things or not, you receive the same DNA from the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you, You became not feeble and you became rich. Did you or not? You became a joint heir straight away. Did you or did you not? Just because you don't have the money in your hands doesn't mean you're not a billionaire. Is this true or not? Right there, it's in the old covenant. So they were slaves. They were getting beaten every day. Right? 
but they come out not feeble at all. How did that happen? I don't know. It must have been a miraculous healing service. But the, but the will of God is being shown us to us there, that what he thinks of his children, right? And then in Exodus 15, 26, God makes this statement and he says, I am the God that healed, King James, healeth thee. <laughs> Tony Vogler version, heals thee. I'm the God that heals thee. Why, why did God say that? I don't know. Like, Maybe because there's all these other gods they've heard about, right? And so there's all these other gods that we think we can go to to get healed. And God tells the Israelites, no, I am the God. I am, I'm the one. All those other gods are fake gods. Whatever else you're looking to doesn't heal you. Don't get me wrong. I'm into natural healing. I'm into eating the right food. I think God gave us, he gave us a pretty good blueprint for what we should eat for our bodies, you know? Whatever comes out of the earth, you know, eat. He said, eat meat after the ark. I think there's a pretty good blueprint in the Bible. A lot of really good people have shown us what we should eat. In other words, not Coke and maybe not Mars bars, which I don't always <laughs> subscribe to. So you can do the natural, knock yourself out with the natural. I believe God gives us amazing foods to bring us healing. All right? But he's also saying, I am the God that heals thee. Not the doctor, not the new age, not the thing swinging from your car, right? Not the rabbit foot, Jehovah Jireh. I'm the healer. It's me that heals you. Psalm 103, which Marie read this morning. This is really pertinent. Who forgives all thine iniquities and who heals all thy diseases. All, 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 that's all. I don't care what they bring up, it's all. He's doing this in the old covenant, right? But here, here this is a real key which we're going to get into. People go, people quote Deuteronomy 28 and say, oh no, but the Lord says if you do this, you're blessed. If you do this, all these things come upon you. Yeah, that's right. Do you have any pages back it is from the New Covenant? It's a lot. Like Jesus changed some things. The curses of Deuteronomy 28 were placed upon him. Yep. Faith in the name of Jesus is now what makes you whole. Now, I'm not saying that if you do those things in Deuteronomy 28, that you're not going to end up in trouble because there's some basic things. You know, the law hasn't been tossed out. It's just been fulfilled. Right? There's still some good wisdom in it. You can still open your door, the doors up to some enemies in your life by not doing Deuteronomy 28, but it doesn't change the fact of what God has done for you. And it doesn't change the fact that you're healed because he took it all. So it's not do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. It's do bad, get good. It's called the grace of God. Did any of you get here this morning perfect without making a mistake? You probably wouldn't know it, but you would have. You only have to have one thought. It's not nice. One selfish, one not loving, not loving the Lord your God with all your heart. If you, if you sort of doubted coming to church this morning, see ya, you're gone. Oh, I thought you were loving the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and strength as soon as you woke up. But you didn't do it, did you? So you didn't make it. You missed the grade. Sorry, you don't get healed today. Come on. We're free from that. <clears throat> okay. So two amazing stories in Luke 5. We all know this story. The man with the mat, with the, 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 they broke through the roof. They placed the man on the mat put him down into the building, right? Amen? And Jesus says, your sins have forgiven thee. He doesn't say you're healed. He says your sins are forgiven. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Why did he say that? 
The Pharisees have that thought, who can, how can he say that? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Duh, God's in your midst, presence. <laughs> they weren't getting it. And he says, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or you're healed. This is the problem. Most of us actually don't believe that we're forgiven. And so we don't see the healing in our life because it's one and the same. Faith comes by hearing, hearing that you're forgiven. See, I'll never forget the day. See, you know when God speaks to you because you never forget where you were, right? All these little examples I say to you that when God spoke to me, I know where I was. I was going up the exit, or not the exit ramp, going up the ramp that would have been the exit ramp into Cairns Central when God said, if you're the only person in the world, I would have died and I sent my son for you, right? And the day when he said to me, I've forgiven you, Forever, I was driving down Sheridan Street on my way to work to go to the Hilton Hotel. And I didn't know that I wasn't forgiven. I'd been living in this subconscious my whole life as a Christian then for three or four years, maybe longer. And I'd heard that I was forgiven a million times. And he said, you're forgiven. It was like someone took 400 weights off my shoulders. And like I ran around like this little kid, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. I want to tell everyone, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. But we are all forgiven. This is the message of the gospel, the forgiveness of sins. Preaching of repentance and the forgiveness of sins. It's not, it's not this great big thing. It's really basic. The law shows you you're a sinner. So if you don't think you need forgiveness, then you need to read more of the law. <laughs> That's all the law is for. To bring us to a place of a need for a saviour. So, so Jesus says, you're forgiven. What is easier to say? You're forgiven or you're healed. It's just something to think about. Something to go deeper with God with. Like I said to you before, oh, I've had this ailment for 20 years. I don't know why. I believed in healing. I've prayed the scriptures. I read the word. I listened to Pastor Tony's message and I'm still sick. Okay. And maybe it's a bit deeper than that. It always is. Life is always deeper. It's always deeper. Deep calls unto deep. This is the mystery of life. It's always deeper than what you think. Why do I do these things all the time? I don't know. I prayed over it. I got this curse broken off. I had 15 sozos. I want to walk straight out the door and I did it again. Go deeper. It's not lining up with the word. Your character's not lining up with the word. Go deeper. Jesus said, I can go to the cross because the devil has nothing on me. Right? So in other words, no, let's not go there. Stay on healing. How long have we been going? Is this okay? Okay, so again in Luke 5, this is before that example. This is the one. This is, the, again, this is where the Lord showed me that he's always willing to heal. Not sometimes, not just with this guy in the Bible. It's always his will to heal. Again, this came from the Holy Spirit quickening the word to me. It didn't come to me by reading this scripture a hundred times. It might start like that, but God lifted the scripture off the page and, and, and exploded it in my spirit. So we have a leper who comes to Jesus. This leper calls him Lord, knows who he is, has heard about him, recognizes that he's someone special. So he calls him Lord. He says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me whole. Lord, I know you have the power, but what I don't know is if you love me. What I don't know is if you care about my condition. What I don't know if my sin is going to stop you from healing me. What I don't know is that, you know, uh, Deuteronomy 28 says I deserve this. What I don't know is do you want to heal me? That's what I don't know, Lord. So he says, are you willing? Are you willing? And Jesus gives him one word. 
two words, I am. And see, you can, you can still say, oh, that was just for that leper he was willing, but there were other people who didn't get healed. No, that's a broad brush statement of the heart of God. It's my will to heal you. It's my will to heal you. It's my will to heal you. <clears throat> okay, let's have a look at this scripture. Mark 6, 56. Gee, that just, now this didn't jump out at me, but I just love reading this scripture. So I'm going to give you the non-King James version, right? So wherever he entered, into villages or cities or country, in other words, everywhere he went, right? Wherever Jesus walked, they laid the sick in the streets. What's that mean? They couldn't get there by themselves. They laid the sick in the streets. In other words, the sick didn't walk there. They're in that bad a condition, they had to lay them there. They had to pick them up, carry them there, put them there, either by beds or by carrying or whatever. These are sick people, okay? And they besought him. In other words, they pulled on him. They tugged on him. They, they continually inquired of him. They cried out to him that if, you could just, if we could just touch, just touch, just touch, not give you a cuddle, not get a sermon, not get all my sins right, not see if I'm a Jew or a Gentile. Come on. If they could just touch the border of his garment, just, just this, just that. What? And as many as did that were healed. This is full on. This guy is a walking, right? This guy is a walking evangelistic nightmare to the devil, right? Everywhere he went. Can you imagine that, Sheridan Street? You know, we did the Olympic torch a couple of years ago, 20 years ago. <laughs> Seems like yesterday. And everyone lined the streets. Everyone come out to see the torch. Can you see Sheridan Street? Filled. People fighting over each other. People pushing each other out of the way. People climbing out like, like in New Guinea when they go and watch an, an NRL game. Up in the trees, on the fences. This is what it's like. This is why Zacchaeus is in the tree, because he couldn't get a view. This is why Jesus had to preach from a boat, because they pushed him into the water. You ever been in a crowd? Jade and I were in a crowd on our, uh, on our honeymoon. It's pretty scary, actually. We were getting squashed. And we, we were, I was worried because I'd heard of those crowd things where you die. You get squashed in crowds. We were getting squashed. This is what it's like. Jesus is he's causing this countryside to be a frenzy. Why? Because he's healing people. Because he said, I'm willing. Why do we doubt that he doesn't want to heal us? Why do we, church? I tell you now, if I see Vaughan walk out of that wheelchair, you'll never stop me walking down the esplanade praying for anyone who's in a wheelchair. Why? Because boldness will come upon you. Because I've seen it. And if he did it for Vaughan, he'll do it for someone else. Wouldn't he? How many people do you think you get saved if Vaughan walks out of that wheelchair? Just from Vaughan's testimony. How many think, people do you think Vaughan will tell? Crikey. <laughs> Vaughan could be the next Paul. You're healed, Vaughan. You're already healed. Whether you, whether you want it or not, mate, there's no condemnation. You're loved exactly the same. There's no, there's no condemnation to whether you get healed or don't get healed. Who as a parent in this room, if you've ever had a child in any kind of dysfunction, whether it's emotional, physical, financial, what is your natural response? You'd say, I'll take that place, wouldn't you? I know my mum would. If I was on a sickbed dying in agony, my mum would say, I'll take that sickbed if Tony could be okay. Right? And we would do it for our children. Wouldn't we? 
So how much more God? Can we go back to the other one, Aaron? This is what Isaiah 53 is saying. Our God took our place. And I, you know, I think God, I think, you know, because of the love of God, I don't necessarily think he gets angry with his children, but I guarantee he shed some tears because his children stay in pain and he's already taken their place at Calvary. I reckon they weep in heaven. Come on. I'm going to address one more area, which is my challenge now for however long I live. I want to blow this degenerate disease area out of the body of Christ. Oh, I'm just getting old now. You know, this, this is normal. This is, I know there's, there's a few people here, I'm looking at them, they're not going to be real happy about this. But I want to lift you up and not mock the suffering. Because I'm getting old too. I know that people might not think that. But like I said, when I was 30, I didn't care about this message. But now I'm starting to see what it feels like to get old. Right? It's true, isn't it? It's natural. But, what, but again, why do we accept it? See, this is, see, I'm sitting in my chair and I'm believing God for some healing in some different areas. And I'm starting to run again, right? I'll give you all my personal testimonies. Just let's be real. And my back sore, right? Oh, Tony, you know, uh, you were a trolley pusher at 15, Tony, right? At 17, you did one year of work in menswear. That was pretty cruisy. But then when you were 18, you were a fitter and turner, right? And you did four years of hard labor, Tony. Oh, hard labor, right? And then when you were 22, you took up portering, Tony. Oh, and Tony, you carried bags for 12 years. Oh, those heavy American bags. Oh, imagine what, yeah, imagine what they've done to your back, Tony. Oh, oh, your back, Tony. Oh, and, and while you're doing all that, Tony, oh, you're running 50, 60, 80 kilometers a week. Oh, Tony, the pounding. Oh, you mustn't have any cartilage left, Tony. Oh, oh now, Tony, Tony, now. Oh, now you've been gardening for 15 years, Tony. Now you've been lifting, you know, metres and metres of mulch. And everyone's garden been. Oh, and it's been so hard, Tony, in Cairns because it's so hot and so humid. Oh, Tony, you need to just go and get yourself a wheelchair and just retire. Oh, Tony, you should never live again. Never hope for anything better. Just accept that you're 52, Tony, and you are getting old and your back's going to be the same. For the next 50 years. Oh, what a great future. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, if you could just take it from me, Lord. If you're willing, Lord. Oh, please help me. (laughs) Woe is me. My God. Are you serious? But But this is what I'm sitting in my chair thinking. I'm thinking this. And then I'm thinking, and I'm looking at this. Right? And I'm getting my plumb line and my anchor and my foundation. And I'm saying, does this line up with it? Can I find a scripture to help me, Lord? All these other Christians, oh, they're all so unwell, Lord. It's just natural in the body. Come on. We're going to make a quality choice. See, I love you guys. And I am going to. Try and do the best I can do with my walk to show you that we don't have to have this in the body of Christ. I don't have to have it in my life. Like I said to you, it doesn't change if I die tomorrow. It's not about me. It's about the message. It's about the message. See, be it unto you according to your faith. Whatever you want. Whatever you can believe for. Whatever you can reach out for and touch. Whatever you're willing to do to get in the front of the crowd and touch the hem. Come on. Right? So what am I doing now? So I'm making a quality decision with my back. 
I'm not going to live like this for the rest of my life. And if I do, I don't care. Message doesn't change. I'm going to preach this message to you. If I have to sit in a wheelchair, I'll do it. This doesn't change. It's not about me. It's not about me. So, who do we have? (laughs) Who do we have in the Bible to look at? Moses. I could have got a part of the movie for that. Moses. Come up here, Moses. (laughs) Take off your sandals, Moses. Because the Bible says that Moses... Eyes were not dim, and his strength was not gone. Oh, that's one example. That's all I need. That's all I need. Because God's, see, I take the word of God, I take the plumb line, and he says, I'm not a respecter of persons. So Moses is no higher in God's eyes than me. Do you believe it? He's not a respecter of persons. So he loves you just as much as he loved Moses. If he did it for Moses, he'd do it for you. See, I don't know why other people, things happen in their life, right? I don't know why. Maybe God will show me. But as for me and my house, (laughs) as for me and my house, amen? Who thinks God's a healer? Who thinks God wants you to be whole? Who thinks God weeps in your pain? Because surely he's born it. Surely he's born it. Surely he's born it. Surely he's taken it. Surely he's taken it. Surely he's taken it. See, people don't understand that on the cross, everything was placed on Jesus' body. But he has taken all thine iniquities. All and forgives all your and and heals all your diseases. All. So Jesus had stage four cancer on his body. He had a meniscus tear. Right? He had migraines. Right? This is why his death was so much more than any other man's death. Because he took it all. Took it all. Takes great strength. Can you imagine every disease that's known to man on your body? On your body? The pain? Can you imagine the pain? It's incomprehensible. That's why, because it's God. He's God. But the great thing is that you can say, he took mine. He took mine. He took mine. I'm finishing now. You know, we're just going to, we're going to pray. I want us to pray over each other. And just believe. And I don't care what happens up here. I don't care if no one gets anything. I'll still believe with you for your healing. We're going to just keep believing for healing. Well, because God says it. Doesn't he, Pastor Pete? I want to see those sort of miracles. You know, I burst into tears when, when I felt my leg get touched. Just the fact that God cared about my knee. How much more people who have been suffering for so long and haven't had a quality of life for for so many different reasons. In Acts 3, when, when when the beggar had been healed by Peter and John, right? Who remembers that story? Yep. Peter and John walk into the temple. See a beggar there, he looks at him, fastens his eyes on him. They say, silver and gold I have not. But in the name of Jesus, be healed. Get up and walk. And then a couple of hours later, all the men, or the people who are seeing this guy who was a beggar, now running around, are looking at Peter and John and saying, who are these men? These gods, these demigods. <laughs> right? So Peter and John are getting all the focus and all the attention. 
And Peter says, why? Let's actually have a look at that. Acts, Acts 3, 16. Aaron, just finishing now. Peter says this. And he says, why are you looking at me and John? Why are you looking at us like we're anything special? Why are you looking at us like we're gods? Or that we have any special powers? And he says, and in his name, through faith in his name, has this man been made strong, whom you see now, yea, the faith which is by him, Jesus, has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. The faith that Peter and John had in the name of Jesus and then the faith that the man had when he heard them say, be healed in Jesus' name, has made him whole. That's it. No one up here who prays for you today has any special power. I don't have any special power unless the Lord decides to bestow it upon me. But what I have is faith. I have faith to believe with you and for you that God is good, that he loves us, and that he, that he weeps when he sees his children in sickness. That's it. And so I encourage you to step out in faith. That's all it is. That's all I ever do. That's all I've ever done with this message. That's all I've ever done. I've told you the stories about when I've been running and I've been 10 kilometers away from home and can't put any weight on my leg with a different injury this time. <laughs> That's what running does to you. But I thought, how am I going to get home? I'm going to have to call a taxi. Huh? I've got a choice to make. I can make a quality decision or I can get a taxi. Right? There's been plenty of times when I've got a taxi, so don't be condemned. But there's been times when I've made a quality decision and I've started running, limping, because I'm believing by faith. I'm believing that I'm healed because the Word said I'm healed. And so as I start to run, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. Well, I'm healed, it hurts, but I'm healed, it hurts, but I'm healed, it hurts, but I'm healed. That's not hurting as much. I'm still healed, not hurting as much. Still healed, not hurting as much. Oh, I'm nearly home now. I'm home. Don't even have to put ice on it when I get home. What was that? I don't know. Don't really care. I'm like the blind man. All I know is I couldn't run, now I can run. Come on. It's just faith. That's all it is. It's all I'm doing this morning, calling you up by faith. I don't know if anyone will get healed. But if we don't come up, you'll never know, will you? And you'll stay in the boat. So if you want to stay in the boat, God bless you. You're loved just as much as anyone else. <laughs> all right? But I'm not staying in the boat. I'm stepping out. <laughs> come on. Oh, what do we do now? Thank you online. We just uh, pray that you guys are blessed today, and uh, we're going to have a prayer service, <laughs> so you miss out. But uh, if you're, is this still on, Aaron? Yeah, if you're at home, just, I just encourage you, what, wherever, whatever's going on at home, lay your hands on that area of your body, and just by simple faith, ask first, you shall receive. And then start thanking because it's been done. Don't keep asking for what has already been done. Thank him for your healing. You just say, in the name of Jesus, this area is whole. Thank you, Jesus, that you've healed that area. Bless you guys. We'll see you next week. Amen.